Hello, and welcome to your first lecture on neural networks and optimization. Today, we're going to cover some of the basic neural network components as well as their architecture. Some of this might be a little bit of review from 392, but we're going to dig a little bit deeper. First, let's talk about neural network architecture. The first component we need to learn about is a node. A node, usually represented by a circle in drawings of neural networks, is just a container that holds a specific value. For instance, here's a node that is holding the value 5.27. The next component we need to talk about are weights. Weights connect two nodes together. In order to get the value in the second node, we take the value in the first node, multiply it by the weight, and add it to this second node. But nodes don't have to have just one input. For instance, here on the right-hand side, our node actually has two inputs coming into it. To get the value of this node on the right-hand side, we take this value, 5.27, multiply it by its weight, and then we take this value, 2.0, multiply it by its weight, and add it to that node. So again, this node has two sources of information. It has inputs coming in from this node, and it has inputs coming in from this node. Together, we get the value of this node is 2.527 because we get a 0.527 from this node multiplied by this weight, and we get a 2 from this node multiplied by this weight. In addition to the previous nodes times their weights, we also add something called a bias to our node. Biases move the value of a node either up or down, no matter what the weights and input values were from the previous nodes. You can think of this term as similar to an intercept in a linear regression. Together, nodes, weights, and biases make up the core structure of a neural network. Here's a little bit more of a complicated example that has three layers of nodes with a lot of different weights and biases. Just a note, when we display a neural network, we typically don't show the biases, but they're always there. So our diagrams of neural network structure often look more like this than the previous example. The next term we need to be familiar with are layers. Layers are groups of nodes at the same level of depth. For instance, in the red, you can see that these nodes make up a layer in our neural network. So do these nodes and this node. That means that this neural network has three layers. Every neural network needs to have at least two layers. The first is an input layer. The input layer determines what data is going into the network. Neural networks also have to have an output layer. The output layer is where our neural network is making a prediction. Anything between the input and output layer is called a hidden layer. And neural networks can have multiple hidden layers. Typically, when we refer to deep learning, we're talking about neural networks that have at least two hidden layers. To review a little bit of math notation, the value of a node is a linear combination of all the nodes in a previous layer that are connected to it. We typically will use this type of notation, where the weights are put in a vector times the input values plus a bias. We can also see it in this dot product form. To give an example of this, let's look at this red node. This red node has four inputs coming from the previous layer, x1, x2, x3, and x4. To get the value of the red node, we're going to have to take each of these input values, multiply them by their respective weights, and add a bias. Basically, you can see what's happening using this formula here at the bottom. These formulas that I introduced before are basically just shorthand for what's happening here. Well, there are a ton of different activation functions that you can use, I want to go over a couple of the most common ones with you. The first one is that boring one we talked about before, a linear activation. A linear activation function takes a value and returns that value, so basically it doesn't do anything. Next, we have a sigmoid activation. Sigmoid activations are very useful because they take values and no matter what those input values are, they squish the output to be between 0 and 1. Next, we have a similar activation function called the tanh function. Like the sigmoid activation function, tanh squishes all of our input values into outputs that are between an upper and a lower bound. However, the bounds this time are between negative 1 and positive 1. 
Last but not least, we have the rectified linear units or ReLU. ReLU activations are really cool and they're inspired by the way that our brains work. If you've ever taken a neuroscience class, you may have learned that neurons only fire once they reach a certain level of activation. ReLU activation functions mimic that by taking values that are negative and just squishing them all to zero and returning positive values as is. This means that we have to reach a certain level of activation before ReLU will return a positive value. This means that if a node has a negative value, ReLU will turn that value into zero, meaning it has no impact. Like the ReLU activation function, for positive values, leaky ReLU returns the value itself. For negative values, leaky ReLU, instead of returning exactly zero, will return that value times some small parameter alpha. This basically reduces the impact of that number without driving it to exactly zero. We can apply activation functions to any of our nodes. Previously, we said the value of this node was going to be all of the input values times their respective weights plus a bias. And that's still true, but on top of that, we are going to apply an activation function represented by this f of all of that input. This means that we take that previous value that we calculated and send it through some type of activation function, maybe a ReLU, maybe a sigmoid, maybe a tan h then that value is what gets sent through to the next layer of the neural network. Let's do an example with actual numbers. First, we need to take all of the values from the previous layer that are connected to this node and multiply them by their weights. So we get one times 0 0.25, now these are done, plus two times 0 0.1, now these are done, then we get plus zero times 1.7, these are done, and last but not least, plus 0 0.5 times negative one. Then of course we need to add our bias, which in this case is negative 0 0.5. Altogether, this equals negative 0 0.55. Five. So now we've done this inside part, but we need to then apply an activation function. If we were applying a linear activation function, we would just return this value negative 0.55 as is. But let's try applying a sigmoid activation. Plugging in negative 0.55 into the sigmoid activation function, which is one over one plus e to the negative x, we get about 0.366. So this is going to be the output value of this red node. It's a linear combination of all the previous nodes plus a bias fed through a sigmoid activation function. Now that we've learned the basic architecture of neural networks, let's look at some familiar models from 392 as neural network. First, let's start with linear regressions. A linear regression is literally just a linear combination of values. So our neural network structure is going to be very simple. Here you can see we have a layer of input values. In this case, we're using age, sex, salary, and rent to predict how much someone is spending on video games. Each of these terms is going to have a coefficient, which we now call a weight. And of course, we're gonna have an overall intercept, which we in a neural network now call a bias. All of those values are gonna to come together in our output node. And because this is linear regression, we're gonna use a linear activation. However, if we change the activation a little bit to be a sigmoid activation, we get a logistic regression. Here we have the same input values, but instead of predicting video game spending, we're predicting whether or not someone is a Twitch streamer. For our input values of age, sex, salary, and rent are multiplied by their weights, a bias is added, but then that value is sent through a sigmoid activation to get an outputted predicted probability. As you can see, neural networks don't have to be super complicated. They're just a way of defining the structure of a model, even a model that's really simple, like a logistic or linear regression. Now that we know a little bit about the structure of neural networks, we need to revisit the concept of loss functions. The architecture of your neural network determines the structure of your model. The loss function determines how you measure the performance of that model. As a reminder, loss functions are metrics that measure the performance of your model where lower values mean better model performance. 
For instance, if you're predicting a continuous value like height or weight or money, you might use something like a mean squared error or the mean absolute error. The mean squared error takes the difference between the actual value and our predicted value, squares it, adds it all together, and then divides by the number of samples. Similarly, the mean absolute error takes the actual minus predicted, or the error, takes the absolute value, and then divides it by the number of samples. You can think of mean squared error as the average squared difference between your model's guess and the actual value. The closer your model's guesses are to the actual value, the lower your mean squared error is going to be. You can also think of mean absolute error in these terms. Mean absolute error is the mean distance between your model's guess and the actual value. If we're predicting a categorical variable, you might use something like log loss, which is also called binary cross entropy. Log loss measures how our prediction matches up with the actual value. For instance, if we have a data point that is in category one, and we predict that there's a 90% probability that that data point is in category one, that's really a great prediction. However, if our data point is in category zero and we predict that there's a 90% chance it's in category one, that's a really bad prediction. This is what log loss or binary cross entropy measures. You may also see a hinge loss function. Hinge loss functions basically ignore or bring to zero very small errors. So if you're very close, you get zero error. Last, let's talk about universal function approximation. Universal function approximation basically means that no matter how complicated the relationship is between the inputs to your model and the output of your model, if your neural network is sufficiently complex enough, it can mimic or figure out what that relationship between inputs and outputs are. And this is why neural networks are so powerful and why we're basically going to spend a whole semester learning about them. Neural networks have a unique capacity to be incredibly complex, which can lead to its own problems, but allows us to model very complicated relationships between inputs and outputs that are associated with important problems like image recognition or sound processing. All right, that is all I have for you. I will see you next time.